Welcome everyone to GAO's Centennial Webinar Series on Major Challenges for the Next 100 Years. My name is Jen Bador, and I am an engineer with GAO's Science and Technology team, and I will be moderating today's panel. To begin, we have a message from the Comptroller General, Jean Dodaro. Hello, I'm Jean Dodaro, Comptroller General of the United States and head of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. 2021 marks GAO's 100th anniversary serving Congress and the American people. As part of our centennial celebration, we are pleased to present this webinar series called Foundations for Accountability, Oversight Issues for the Next 100 Years. We rely on a deep pool of expertise within and outside the agency to help monitor changes in public policy and management. In addition to our own people at GAO, we also consult with advisory panels, such as the Comptroller General's Educators Advisory Panel, independent researchers, and agency managers who implement the policies and programs we audit. We are proud to bring these experts together for webinars covering the following topics. Leading practices to manage, empower, and oversee the federal workforce. Building integrated portfolios of evidence for decision-making. Managing complexity across public policy challenges. The legal context of accountability and major challenges for the next 100 years. These webinars will explore the goals, conflicts, tensions, and challenges that shape the need for rigorous evidence-based decision-making to improve government and support oversight. They will highlight promising and effective practices that can help achieve these goals and demonstrate what GAO has done and will continue to do to support an effective, economical, efficient, equitable, and ethical federal government. I hope you will find them informative. Please enjoy. First, I would like to thank the Comptroller General for his introduction and our panelists for agreeing to participate in today's webinar. I would also like to thank the many people who have been working behind the scenes to make this event happen, with special thanks to Mandy Pritchard, Brody Garner, and Carrie Burgott. This year, GAO is celebrating its centennial, 100 years since its founding. During this celebration, we have had time to reflect on GAO's progress and accomplishments over the past century, such as our work in areas like healthcare, foreign policy, natural resources, and defense. But for this webinar, I would like to take the opportunity to focus our attention on the next century. What challenges will we face? What trends or events will define GAO's future? And perhaps more importantly, how should we be prepared to respond to these challenges? Although we can't predict the future, that doesn't mean that we have to wait around for a challenge to surprise us. Instead, I'll be curious to hear what our pan panelists think on how to best prepare to meet future challenges. As Dwight D. Eisenhower said, Plans are nothing, planning is everything. I'm very excited to hear the range of perspectives from our panelists today. For our listeners, please feel free to type questions in the chat box on Zoom, and we will try to use those questions in our Q&A with the panelists. To begin with, I'd like to introduce the speakers. I will read each speaker's bio, and then we'll turn it over to the speaker and panelists for them to um, give us a little bit more information about themselves if needed, and then to answer the following question. What do you see as a persistent or future challenge in your field, and how do you think we could best prepare to meet these challenges? So uh, we will kick it off today with Dr. Anthony Wilbon. Dr. Anthony Wilbon is the Dean of Howard University's School of Business, Dr. Wilburn, Wilbon's expertise is in strategic technology management. He is also a certified project management professional. Dr. Wilbon's area of research includes technology strategy, quantitative analysis, information technology, and technology innovation and entrepreneurship. He has also explored research in sustainable environmental engineering through the integration of social, environmental, and economic considerations into system design methods through funded NOAA research projects. 
Dr. Wilbon has previously held positions at organizations such as the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and Booz Allen in Hamilton. His professional experience and capabilities extend to business, management, and technology related topics, including systems application and technology, production and operations management, project management, systems development lifecycle, and research methodology. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilburn, for joining us today. Um, I will hand, hand it over to you um, to continue your bio and to tell us what you think the challenges are. Thank you, Jen. And I, I appreciate the invitation from GAO. Um, and so again, thank you for the bio. I, I, I've done quite a few things in, in my career, uh, starting as an engineer um, and kind of blending my experiences in tech, technology and management and business. So I kind of have a, a pretty good feel for some of the, the dynamics that happen between the two, the two worlds. Um, and so uh, based on my experiences, the challenges that, that I see happening, and I'll speak to, to this from um, an education perspective, but also kind of an entrepreneurship perspective, because that's where my, a lot of my research has occurred. And, and I think the two, the two uh, cross over quite a bit. Um, we are starting to prepare a lot of our students to consider the world of, of entrepreneurship as an option for them, uh, because I think, again, small businesses, as, as we all know, are the engines that drive our economy. And it's important that we sustain them and, and support them. Uh, but in doing so, we also have to make sure that we recognize that there is a need to have uh, uh, a technology base for them. Technology literacy is critically important. Um, and so we're, we're infusing that in our students, but I think we also have to infuse that in the businesses that we that we create. Um, uh, we, we, we have a dependency on technology for consumer purposes and, and focus on the end user, but we really have to kind of infuse and upskill people so that they understand the dy dynamics of uh, functions of technology and the applications of technologies and the development of technologies. Um, that's gonna help build the infrastructure, uh, create things like broadband networks and high performance computings that, are, that will actually impact uh, small businesses. And if we don't do that, I think the outcome is that you'll have a, a situation whereby we create a, you know, you know the term digital divide, uh, which has been an ongoing issue but it's shifting. So, you know, it was the, the divide used to be that we'd be focused on um, on uh, people or businesses that didn't have access to technologies. Now it's not about access, it's about the type of technologies um, and, and, the, and the breadth and depth of the technology that you have. And so we have people who have uh, small businesses that, for example, don't have high access to, to uh, broadband networks and that creates a disadvantage for them. So we have to really focus on, on building the infrastructure um, and in doing so, we have to deal with issues such as cybersecurity and big data and, and those kinds of things. So there's a lot of technology fusion with business and application that we have to really try to address. Um, that's gonna be a challenge for us going forward that have an impact not only on uh, our economy, but the social structure that we live in and also the international placement of the United States in general. So um, those are kind of the things that will be that, that I think are important. And, and uh, I hope that we can uh, have that discussion about some of that stuff today. Thanks, Jen. Turn it back over to you. Great, thank you for that. Our next panelist is Dr. Sean Mooney. Dr. Mooney is the Dean of the Indiana University Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Dr. Mooney's research interests lie in the questions related to the use of natural resources and the environment. She is an economist that has worked for many years on topics related to water use in the Western United States, endangered species and the impact of climate change, and, the, and has secured more than $4 million in external grant funding. Recently, she has become interested in the incentives that scientists face to address complex problems as part of multidisciplinary teams and the role of science information in decision making. So welcome, Dr. Mooney, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Jen. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me today and welcome to everybody. Certainly a tremendously interesting topic. Um, I'm gonna focus my comments on um, natural resources, uh, environment, and then also a little bit of education as well. Um, certainly we are facing tremendous challenges right now. Many of them um, are very present at the current time as we're looking at uh, uh, exceptional seasons of wildfire, 
um, exceptional flooding and many natural disasters related to um, climate change and environmental change at the present time. And you know, clearly this has been on our minds for, for many years. And, uh, and I think that this is one of the sort of persistent and ongoing issues that we as a country have been um, dealing with. Uh, some of the things that we have already put in place are things like uh, monitoring systems and um, uh, protections for, uh, for natural resources and environment. But I think that we're about to experience probably a, a very uh, uncertain period going forward where we're likely to see lots of uh, change, variability, and um, perhaps uh, the, the greatest uh, um, perhaps a great velocity of change actually as we go forward. And so this is going to have uh, essentially driven by climate change. This is gonna have tremendous impacts on our natural resources, environment, human health, and then also the economy. And as I mentioned, the pace of change is really uh, increasing. So uh, Jen mentioned earlier on a really great, great quote, plans are nothing, planning is everything. And, uh, and I do really think that as we uh, are moving forward into this new era, planning most definitely um, is everything. I think that uh, some of the challenges uh, that we're gonna face are gonna be really quite large in these areas. Um, we have uh, uh, an increase in extreme events, uh, we have uh, perhaps a change in uh, both uh, terrestrial resources and aquatic resources, so land and water, um, their productivity and their ability to sustain uh, economic activities and then also uh, provide habitat for wildlife is really quite changing as is also their spatial extent. And so um, I think that some of these things are going to be really the, some of the major challenges, like how do we manage for resilient uh, resources and environment as we move forward into the future. And then also, I think the, the uh, in concert with this, the intersection between um, the vast income inequality that we see here in this country and the ability of individuals to, um, to thrive under a potentially much more um, volatile climate situation. So preparing to meet these challenges, um, some of these, uh, uh, some of the things that I think that we can do is uh, continue to really focus on uh, producing a very well educated and uh, ethical workforce with the skills to help us um, robustly monitor, uh, forecast and develop and design um, policies uh, for the future that um, that can be uh, critically evaluated and monitored perhaps on a more uh, frequent basis. As I mentioned, I think the pace of change is really increasing. Um, I think important in that will be to uh, train people who can really understand uh, these complex situations from a variety of viewpoints. Uh, I think it's important that we um, generate a workforce that is able to interact across numerous different viewpoints because I think that these are are uh, important situations that cannot be just solved with a, a, a single viewpoint. Um, I think really also understanding, uh, being able to better understand some of the values and services obtained from nature, some of the things that we obtain right now is also going to be really vitally important as we move forward into the future. And uh, with that, I'll end my comments, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mooney. Our next panelist today is Mr. Steven Sanford. Mr. Sanford is a managing director of GEO's team on strategic planning and external liaison or SPELL. Mr. Sanford leads strategic planning and foresight programs for the GAO. Prior to becoming managing director, he was the director of the GAO Center for Strategic Foresight. As a leader in public sector foresight and design thinking, he directed the team that developed GAO's 2018 to 2023 strategic plan and accompanying trends. And in 2018, he served as assistant director leading the team that produced GAO's first technology assessment on artificial intelligence. He frequently speaks to public sector, international and private sector organizations about emerging issues and the use of foresight and strategic planning to improve organizational performance, including presentations on artificial intelligence, enterprise planning, and leadership to US and global audiences. Mr. Sanford is also the founder and host of GAO's Foresight Speaker Series. 
Welcome, Mr. Sanford, to this panel. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jen. Great being here with you and, and with such a distinguished uh, panel. Uh, good to see the uh, members of uh, GAO's Educators Advisory Panel uh, joining us uh, today. And um, you know, a lot of what's been said already uh, resonates quite a bit as we you know contemplate the last hundred years and think ahead about the hundred years uh, to come for GAO, and not only for GAO but also for uh, our government and our system of government. Uh, I, I think. Uh, from, from my perch at GAO, where we think about the future of GAO, and we also help facilitate uh, the agency's uh, links to the uh, outside world, uh, connecting GAO to international partners, connecting GAO to the audit and accountability community uh, at the federal level, and also throughout the states and localities uh, across the entire United States, we are uh, often confronting a host of extremely complex uh, problems that face all levels of government. And uh, I think that's probably where I feel the biggest uh, challenge rests in the future for not only GAO, but also uh, all uh, uh, entities interested in, in good government and good governance. The types of problems and types of challenges um, that Dr. Wilbon, that Dr. Mooney have already uh, alluded to, really are anchored in complexity. And I think the uh, key uh, unifying concept around a lot of the challenges we face right now is around complexity. The uh, challenges don't sit neatly within any one silo or any one uh, subject area or domain. These are uh, multi-domain, multi-sector, multi-layer problems, whether we're talking about different layers of government in the United States, whether we're talking about uh, transnational boundary issues, whether we're talking about the intersection of the public sector, the private sector, the uh, non-governmental sector, and, and whether we're talking about um, you know, spillovers from one uh, domain like healthcare into another like the economy or supply chains. And we've seen this play out uh, as we are still uh, fighting our way through the pandemic. Uh, we've seen what started as a, uh, uh, a health issue, uh, a, a virus, spill over into areas uh, affecting education, uh, technology, uh, supply chains, the economy. It, the, the COVID you know, crisis has shown very dramatically how interrelated and how quickly uh, different domains are and, and, and how quickly they can spill over uh, into each other. So I think there's a powerful lesson there. Uh, and there's no shortage of other examples where we see similar things happening. So uh, as, as we contemplate the challenges for the next 100 years and, and talk today as a panel, uh, I, I think keeping in mind some of the things that have already been said about complexity uh, are really essential. And then Jen, you also said something that resonates uh, with, with me from our planning and foresight standpoint that you can't predict the future. And that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, foresight is not about trying to predict the future, but rather being prepared for the future and imagining the different futures we might encounter and thinking about what we can do today to, to be ready. So uh, happy to join you all today. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is Mr. Mark Gaffigan. Mr. Gaffigan is the Managing Director for GAO's Natural Resources and Environmental Team based in Washington, DC. The Natural Resources and Environment Team is responsible for GAO's assessment of federal efforts to manage our nation's land and water resources, protect the environment, ensure food safety, manage agricultural programs, and ensure a reliable and environmentally sound energy supply meet the nation's science challenges and address US and international nuclear security and cleanup. Mr. Gaffigan began his career with GAO in 1987 and has worked on a variety of reviews of federal programs with an emphasis on budget and program reviews of the US Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Welcome to the panel today. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jan, and uh, thank you to my fellow panelists. It's an honor to uh, be on this panel panel with such distinguished folks. Um, you know, when I got the charge to talk about what's going to happen in the next 100 years, I think the first challenge I 
sort of think about is, well, I don't think I'm going to make it for the next 100 years, although uh, uh, I will do my best. But I do uh, recently have added to my family uh, two grandsons. So uh, I hope that they're around for the next 100 years. And uh, so this one is for, for Cedric and Jace. Um, you know, it's very interesting. We had the uh, comments about uh, planning, and I'm reminded of a magnet that was on my mom's refrigerator for a number of years. And it, it said, we plan and God laughs. Um, and I'm a big believer in planning. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Eisenhower for the uh, interstate highway system. Um, that's part of planning. But I think what that quote tells us is we're gonna have to evolve. We're gonna have to be flexible. We're gonna have to adjust. And I see that happening over the next hundred years as uh, Steve talked about the complexity of things that we face become more and more complex. I'm going to bring the perspective of a performance auditor. Um, the, the work that uh, I've done in my career at GAO, looking at how um, government uh, could do things better to help in various situations and with, through various programs. And so as uh, many of the folks who meet me who are new to GAO quickly learn, I quickly quiz them on what's the secret of GAO and I sometimes get a puzzled look, but it starts with uh, what are the criteria that we're looking at, that we're assessing, you know, what, and ultimately that is what is that federal government role? That's our sort of our starting point. And we go out and assess the condition of what is against, you know, what should be the criteria. And in that work, we try to see if there's a disconnect between those two things and address our recommendations towards the cause uh, of a disconnect between uh, the condition and criteria. And what strikes me about the challenge for performance auditors going forward is dealing with the complexities that the panelists have mentioned. And in particular, the cross-cutting nature of these issues. And as federal auditors, we come in with the perspective, of, okay, what's the federal role? That's a common question we ask at the beginning. And that's become more and more complicated due to the cross-cutting nature of the issues we're facing today. I mean, climate ch change is a a classic example of that. It, it doesn't require just the government to do something, right? It's just not solely the federal government's role. It requires a whole, not only a whole of government at all levels, federal, state, local, tribal, but a whole society approach in the non-governmental sector to address these issues. And that's really reflected in um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals which if you look at, they're about the, the health and well-being of people, which directly aligns with GEO's goal one, where we talk about you know, the health and well-being of people, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, um, the, uh, the chemicals that are in our, our, um, in our economy. Those are all things that are directly in my portfolio, and that's where we direct our efforts to try to provide some sense of what the federal government can do. And, we have found that identifying that role in concert with a recognizing the other roles that are played is really important in our work. And I see that as a, a particular challenge. If we're going to address these issues as a society, uh, we're going to need all hands on deck. It really will require a whole society approach. And government does play a role, but the federal government is not the only answer uh, to this. And one of the things we've done in the, the performance audit side that I've seen uh, is a really great tool is criteria around collaboration, the importance of collaboration in addressing these issues. And it starts with, for example, defining roles and responsibilities. Who's, who's doing what and how? And, you know, the, the recent pandemic and response there and kind of the confusion on how to respond things is a classic example of what can go wrong when we don't sort of have a plan. Uh, and, and defined roles and responsibilities of who's going to address that. So I see that as a major challenge in, uh, for our society going forward and in our work as uh, auditors looking at what the federal government can do. And in the climate change arena, um, for example, we have developed not only using collaboration criteria, but pointing out a framework, for example, in building resilience uh, uh, in response to these issues where we talk about the federal government can play the role of integrator, right? Bringing people together, defining roles and responsibilities. It can provide the role, the role of providing information 
uh, you know, good data so we know what to do, how high to build that wall if we're trying to strengthen for climate change. And it can provide incentives in the form of um, pushing folks in different directions, which are going to help address those problems. So that's something that we talk about in terms of work that we're doing and the building resilience to climate change. But it's something that um, could be used in almost any of the work that we do. Again, recognizing the complexity, cross-cutting nature of many of these issues and trying to define what that government role is in the context of the whole of society. So I see that as a major challenge going forward. And thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Gaff again. Our last but certainly not least panelist today is Dr. Tim Persons. Dr. Persons is GAO's chief scientist and one of two managing directors of the science technology assessment and analytics team. The team conducts technology assessments, provides oversight of federal science and technology programs, provides technical assistance on science and technology issues to the Congress, and develops innovative analytical techniques for carrying out audits and evaluations. Dr. Persons joined GAO in 2008. Prior to that, he served in key executive roles at the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity and the National Security Agency. Dr. Persons is a recipient of a 2020 Fed 100 Award in recognition of national artificial intelligence leadership. Dr. Persons, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Jen, uh, and thanks very much for uh, the organizers for this. It's a privilege to be uh, able to stand at the cusp of GAO's newest century, looking back and standing on the shoulders of the giants from the first century. And for my part, I think we'll just make it a, you know, run the whole table here. Uh, I'm a big fan of Eisenhower's quote as well. Planning is essential, and that's why I'm proud to be here to talk about this. Uh, and do this in terms of our work with respect to science and tech issues, as well as uh, the work that Steve leads in terms of our uh, strategic foresight work within GAO. So very nice to be here. Um, uh, Jen, as you mentioned, my, my background, I have been in the uh, national security and intelligence community. So I have a, a little bit of insight on that, which will inform my opening remarks today, as well as uh, some prior service I was in our biomedical system with a lot of advanced technologies things, which probably by now are outdated, but nonetheless, having a little bit of the, what, what I might call the bio info nano uh, type view of things, meaning the biologic life sciences, the information uh, age that we're in, and, and then the nano in terms of material science and things that we're seeing. And so at the top, I'll just say, we really are uh, in an era where uh, it, as the National Academies calls it, we're talking about convergent technologies. Uh, it's not enough that we have, for example, as, as uh, Anthony mentioned, 5G wireless. We, that is a, a key thing. It's just, that's just opening the bandwidth of the data pipes to, to, to pass around and ship around the data and operate in a world of the internet of things and so on that is driving uh, the digital economy. But that's one thing. And then you start to, uh, lay in the fact that we really are in the era of the algorithm. And so uh, if things, our lives are being run by optimized algorithms and that uh, can be very good in many cases, is, is extremely good in many cases, but can be challenged uh, or, or cause challenges uh, nonetheless. And so we have to think about what that means. So I think those convergent issues about like taking the algorithms plus the massive amount of data, the rate at which the data is being put around and so on is just creating an entire new, uh, uh, I guess what, what is driving the fourth industrial revolution as the World Economic Forum calls it. It's the fusion of the digital world and the physical world. But the four key challenges that I see uh, that, that really are um, part of this in this convergent type era that we're in, uh, I see, first of all, just starting off with the idea of digital services itself. I mentioned AI, or artificial intelligence that captures our imagination with all of the, the cool Hollywood movies and sci-fi films that I certainly am a fan of. I love all of that, but that apocalyptic dystopian vision is not the reality. We do have risks with machine learning and AI and data management and so on, but it's not the take over the world and, and destroy uh, humankind kind of risks on that. We have to think about, and, and really AI is under the umbrella of digital services. We have this emerging and emergent uh, digital services oriented uh, economy, and we're just on the cusp of that. 
And just as in the late 19th century, the steam engine drove the economy uh, into the 20th century, and we still have steam generated uh, uh, power structures today, so too digital is like the new steam engine of driving that economy. And we're just back in sort of that late 19th century um, era, in my view, to do that. But again, if you're passing around a lot of data, if you have these uh, connected systems, then you really are talking about increasing your attack surface on cybersecurity. And that's why GAO has a very good uh, IT and cybersecurity team, a uh, sister team to STAA, uh, working on all those issues, including privacy and civil liberties, but also why we have an innovation lab to explore the algorithm, what that means for oversight and things like that. So but it does require different statistical thinking in terms of the workforce. So as Anthony mentioned, there's a, a workforce transition that, that, that needs to happen. We need to train them to think statistically, uh, regardless of where they are. They don't have to become PhD statisticians, but nonetheless, that's where we are. And really, as we're seeing through this pandemic is a change in the future of work. Um, the second area is really, as Sean was mentioning, is what I'll just call environmental stewardship and Mark, uh, Mark's team uh, leads our climate change portfolio, so uh, you can't have that conversation about environmental stewardship without climate change, and it really, a lot of the conversation in the next century is going to be about uh, adaptation to that particular change, but it's not only that. It's how do we think about circular systems or circular economies with materials so that what ends up in the landfill, or do we even have a landfill, because we're, we're smart about thinking through a life cycle on how we we use and manage materials all the way through. Uh, the other thing is how we think about our oceans, the blue economy. We haven't ever monetized really what our oceans mean to us that we know they mean a lot. So uh, those are our key things that we have to think about. And so the environmental uh, area is the key issue. Uh, the third key, um, uh, I think, pillar of this is that you have public health. And of course, Steve mentioned the pandemic and we're all in the midst of that. It is, it is a massive sort of a glacial change of not, I don't mean the rate of that, but just it's, it's forging uh, in part the new economy driven by digital and the future of work and things. Uh, so uh, we, but we have to get better at uh, dealing with emerging, predicting and dealing with emerging infectious diseases. The GA has done uh, a, a years long wor work uh, of this particular thing before the pandemic. Uh, but I would also say the aging demographics uh, is a big thing. Uh, every day, uh, 10,000 baby boomers in the United States uh, are retirement eligible or become that way. And we're, that's going to be inexorably a march for uh, up to the next decade or the next, next uh, many, many years. So how that change happens and how we uh, provide health care services or, or think about the longevity of life is a big issue. I would also say that in the public health area that uh, food security is a big deal uh, and not just for developing countries. We have challenges in the United States, a developed country, and there's food deserts even in various wards in the District of Columbia. Uh, and there's research that Howard has done or is doing on this particular thing. Uh, Anthony may speak to any of that, but those are the kind of things that we need to think about as a, as a public health issue. Uh, to make sure that we're pursuing uh, food security and equity of access and so on to healthcare, uh, among many other things. Uh, and then lastly, for the national security uh, topic, I was my fourth is just, I think we're seeing a return of the great power competition. And so that's the rise of China. That's the big thing economically there. We have close trade and ties with that. That's good for stability between the countries. But as the countries uh, continue to grow in prominent significance and as this digital economy emerges, uh, how we protect our intellectual property, how we secure research and development, which are kind of the stem cells of ideas that go into uh, the future patents and the future uh, value creation systems that we have and need. Uh, that's going to be a key issue in our national security area, in addition to the cybersecurity uh, dimensions that I mentioned earlier in our digital economy. So uh, thank you for having me. Those are sort of the four key areas, but there's many things to go into. Uh, they are interconnected, as Steve says, and I think there's some good things to, to speak on in, that in the following uh, time. Thank you. Great. Thanks to all of our panelists for a great introduction. I'm definitely already hearing lots of themes such as the complexity of challenges, how the response will likely have to be interdisciplinary um, and involve 
many different groups um, and that all of our panelists really like planning, which is great. Um, so we're going to transition now into the Q&A portion. Uh, so I'd like to invite all the panelists to turn on their video. Um, I would also like to remind the listeners that they can go ahead and use the chat box if you'd like to submit questions for our panelists. I have actually already received one question, so I will kick us off with um, a listener sent in question. So this listener is asking about how um, the challenges are, again, cross sector, you need lots of different people to get on board. Um, and they're, they're very complex. So, so this listener asks, um, do the panelists think that our ability to build consensus and respond has increased? So for example, the government in order to do something might have to build consensus with a lot of different stakeholders. Um, so this listener is asking for your perspectives on that. Um, are things like technology, are they dividing society rather than promoting consensus? Um, so I will pause there and I will let any of the panelists who'd like to respond uh, do so. Well, I'll, I'll get us started and then and then maybe um, you know tag team to others uh, as they want to chime in. But what I've understood from a lot of conversations with uh, Tim and, and Mark and others at GAO is on, on some of these really important uh, national issues uh, that involve competitiveness, uh, technology, uh, the place of the U.S. vis-a-vis uh, -vis other competitors in the world. There's a lot of bipartisan support for. Uh, looking at how the government is responding to those challenges. And I think that's an area where moving forward, especially when it comes to these, these grand challenges around environment and science and technology, uh, you know, the voices of which we're hearing from today on this panel, I think there are strong indicators of bipartisan interest in these issues, especially when it comes to uh, US competitiveness and, and our role vis-a-vis -vis others uh, in the world. So I'll, I'll kick it off with that and, and, and maybe see if others um, have, have something to add. I would agree with that, Steve. I, I would just say I, I like the phrase um, uh, someone coined about we really are in this, what, what I think of as the complex adaptive systems era, right? It's not enough to say, well, we need to solve the emerging infectious disease problem of public health without talking about climate change and when you because we are thinking actually in this panel about the next century so you do have to think in centennial time frames around climate change that's that's what distinguishes it from the day-to-day -day weather that we feel you have to really have a long term but that sort of changing it, uh, things uh, a changing climate will drive changing demographics will, will, will drive changing public health outcomes and risk will shift and so there's a there's certainly I think a need to think in a more uh, Jen used the right words we we really do need this interdisciplinary approach and uh, we have two senior academicians on the panel I, I think there's definitely room in my opinion I, our university system by far is number one it's fantastic but there still has to be reform about how do we think about that inter training in that interdisciplinarity because just solving one thing and one one uh, of, a, of a global problem one corner of it is not going to solve the whole thing and I think our backing up to the legislative conversation I think we have to think in legislative terms uh, in that way as well. So I, I, I think there's some massive changes coming. We're going to struggle adapting to it, but I think we can think it through that planner lens like Eisenhower does and, and maybe help mitigate risk. And I think that's a key role for GAO. Um, I could uh, jump in uh, on some of those comments as well, Tim, and I uh, agree with you in terms of um, you know, the need for uh, a, a group of individuals, a workforce that is able to um, deal with, with this kind of complexity to work across different sectors, public, private, nonprofit, um, and then also uh, to be able to communicate across a kind of a, a broad scope of, of disciplines and not be so siloed. Um, you know, in terms of uh, technology and, and uh, the question of balkanizing society, I mean, you know, definitely we read a lot about that right now. But I also think, you know, that technology 
offers uh, tremendous opportunities for us going into the future. I mean, it's kind of it's a mixed bag, <laughs> clearly. And uh, but, you know, I think our ability to um, to be able to track and to monitor, to be able to look at water quality, um, uh, air pollution, um, to better for forecast sort of near term weather and um, and also to kind of look to the future using uh, technological approaches is a really great asset. And, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, I, I really do think that, you know, something from the educational perspective that we might want to stress, and this is just one thing, is, you know, I, I really do think, you know, that this more interdisciplinary training, you know, people who are, for example, scientists that are deeply embedded uh, in a particular technology or a particular area, but also have, you know, a, a good understanding of some of the issues of sort of policy management evaluation so that we can kind of talk across sectors and um, and across uh, uh, different perspectives. And then similarly, you know, for those who, uh, you know, that might be more in the area of sort of, you know, economics, accounting, or, or other sort of management areas, uh, you know, to have an understanding of also what might be driving some of the science so that there's more ability to kind of uh, communicate uh, across all of these um, different areas. And I'll, I'll add one thing as well to, to follow up on what Sean suggested from the educational perspective. I mean, I, I always, often tend to look at technology as being um, results oriented and nonpartisan to some degree, um, because that's where the focus is, 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 is the end, the, the outcome. Um, and we, 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 I believe that we try to create environments whereby we, we are inclusive in that regard. So for example, as, as several have mentioned, interdisciplinary focus is, is key on the academic institutions that, that I know of. Uh, we're working together on a lot of different projects to solve problems and bringing in all the disciplines to do that. So um, I, I think, for example, we're, we've been doing some work in cybersecurity. Um, and that particular work includes not only people from the, the technology perspective, but the business applications, uh, have impact the political scientists, the economists. We even have people from Russia, from the Russian language department who are involved. Uh, all of that is part of trying to build a solutions oriented uh, application that's going to be able to address some of the issues that we're facing. Now, again, the flip side of that again is, is being so results oriented. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, does create an opportunity for us to build a division of sorts between the people who have the access to the technologies and the people who do not. And the, the risk that we run in, in doing that, creating a division, as Tim mentioned, is, is not having a, a mature workforce that can come along and actually in, involve itself in continuing the build of that technology going forward. So there's a, there's a dual uh, uh, operation that needs to take place. We have to focus on the technology and addressing those needs. We also, also have to focus on bringing everybody into the fold to be part of the, the solution process. Yeah, I'll just finish by adding, you know, the original question about consensus. Consensus is hard. And we're talking about, you know, going across governmental levels, you know, going to the private sector. Just within the federal government, there are so many programs that are set up to address issues that aren't working together. You know, whether you're talking about a response to climate change, food safety. I was mentioning just prior to this meeting, the uh, recent report we did with our healthcare team looking at the, the nexus between um, you know, uh, information about uh, healthy eating and, and healthcare and chronic diseases, lots of initiatives and a common recommendation of us, and this is just within the federal government, is to work together and come up with a strategy. And I mentioned earlier the collaboration criteria, who's doing what, and who's in charge? That is like a key question. And so if we're struggling to do that just within the federal government, imagine doing that across multiple levels of government and then the non-governmental sector. So that is a challenge and that that's hard work, but that's, that's what our democracy is about, right? Bringing different perspective stakeholders together. It's messy, but it's what we do to try to bring all those perspectives together. And that's the same thing we'll face in addressing all these issues. And again, not just in the US, but then internationally as well. Thank you. Thanks all for your perspectives. Um, I want to pivot us a little bit to tech, technology and technological innovation. Um, you know, I think if we look at the past 100 years, it's very much defined by advances in technology. And I think several of our panelists have a background and experience in that. Um, you know, our, 
even this this video call here, you know, probably couldn't even happen a decade ago. So um, I'm thinking as we look forward, what are ways we can actually foster that innovation um, or maybe the opposite? What are ways that would really just um, suppress that innovation? Um, what I'll be curious to hear our panelists thoughts on that. So feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll start and, and suggest that, um, that fostering innovation kind of historically has happened in, in three ways. I think um, my, my panel uh, members may agree with this. Um, it, it happens either through small businesses, people with less than you know 10 people, they're tinkering on the, with ideas and they're creating solutions um, and they really have the flexibility and the autonomy to really dig into ideas and problems and find solutions. And that leads to commercial products, or commercial um, uh, uh, solutions to some of the some of the most pressing problems we have. And then we go back historically. We can talk about you know automobiles and consumer products, uh, uh, elect, you know, consumer electronics with Apple, Microsoft, social media. All of those were smarter started by small companies with two or three people working on trying to find a, an innovative solution to a problem. The second way that innovation occurs is through uh, large companies who invest in R and D. And so they make a, a conscious effort to invest large amounts of money into science and technology and innovation labs and so forth. And we think of, for example, the 3Ms, the Pfizer's, the AT&T's, the Apple's and those, those kinds of things. And then the third way that innovation is fostered uh, is through uh, mission-driven government research that finds its way into commercial applications. And so work that DOD and, and, and NIH and NASA is doing. So all three of these things we talked about, Stephen talked about complexity, I think where we really can foster innovation using that historical model is to figure out a way to get all three of these entities to work together to work on solutions and innovative solutions to problems. And all three of them play, I think, an important role. Um, and, and particularly government. Uh, the government has an, an opportunity to be a leader in this regard by creating uh, policies and standards and, and support for international uh, intellectual property um, and sustaining an investment in R&D and science infrastructure and innovation to enhance our competitiveness as a country. Um, and so uh, I, I think the government can take a leadership, the GAO can take a leadership role in that and accelerate the development and commercialization of new technologies and innovation, um, not only just meeting national goals, but also just meeting uh, the, the, the levels of expectations that us as uh, normal people do with using technology in a, in a uh, daily basis. Now, some of the issues that may suppress that uh, or, or create impediments for that is this whole concept of the, the you know, structural inertia that it takes place when you have large entities like bureaucracies and governments uh, being in control of that. And we have to figure out a way to be more nimble and flexible and adaptable so that we can encourage innovation. Um, structural inertia is I think one of the, the, the key impediments to, to, to an environment of fostering innovation. And we have so much of that happening uh, not only at the government level, but in large organizations, and large corporations. And that's why you see the bulk of it happening in smaller businesses. Um, but I think all of us have to work together in order to figure out a way to, to find an answer to that. I think Anthony's answer is well said. So all, all I'll say is, I, you know, sort of some symmetry with that is uh, that mission focused, more agile, as Anthony was, I'll just put that word on it. Uh, more flexible, more open aperture type R&D. So it's not the quote usual suspects, but you are doing things. And you, you saw, you've seen, or we have seen uh, innovation in the R&D process with things like the DARPA grand challenges. And so prize like approaches to doing things that really democratizes a lot of that kind of thing. So I think more of that along the way is part of that. But then you have to cross the valley of death, whether it's a, a, the technology or the manufacturing of the technology, those sort of things. And so I think there's a key role for public-private partnerships. That's generally an, amorph an amorphous kind of thing that needs to be contextually defined. So that's both good and bad. But I think that, uh, you know, again, as we think if these challenges and opportunities, I appreciate Sean bringing up opportunities because that has to be here. It's not all a scary future. We can use foresight to try and imagine the future we would like. And, and capitalize on still our country is considered, and I'm told by my friends overseas, the most innovative country in world history. And so we can continue that. 
uh, riding the digital wave, doing things, but coming up with ways to work in public-private partnerships. There are useful models uh, there. And then, as I mentioned, the digital way, I think, you know, thinking about how we, we uh, capitalize on that and, and generate value and IP out of that, we do have to think about research infrastructure. And I think that's part of uh, what you see in a push for like a national research cloud, right? Because the idea of uh, our like a National Science Foundation grant paying for a principal investigator and they, they do this great work, but then it's parked at University of X's, uh, you know, digital servers and not widely shared apart from the uh, the paper that the papers that are generated themselves is we're, I think we're missing some opportunities in that kind of interconnectedness, interdisciplinarity, those sort of things where uh, where we've seen that. So we've seen successes on the messenger RNA viruses because you're starting to tie in sort of a biocomputational perspective with the long-term biologic research of the NIH. And it really was the mRNA that resulted in Pfizer and Moderna came from DARPA from 20 years ago. So it's that that's that early stage agile problem and mission centered type thing that then moves up the value chain through these systems. And I think we can we can tweak and add and do better. Yeah, I, I would just add very briefly, you know, the, the uh, landscape that, that Dr. Wilbon laid out in terms of those three elements, uh, building off what, what Tim just said too, you know, this forms an ecosystem and um, not, no one of those uh, elements is alone sufficient to uh, propel the U.S. forward in terms of um, maintaining uh, competitiveness and uh, realizing the types of technological advances uh, that, that have just been described. The, the other thing I'll note, too, is, is a little bit um, related to your question, Jen, I think, that the types of things that can derail some of the innovation uh, curve, as well as a... Uh, uh, a fear-based approach or, or um, looking only at the potential downsides of technology. Uh, you know, all technologies can be used for, for good and for ill. Uh, an airplane can uh, uh, unite uh, countries and people and, and, and enable a global economy. It can also be a, a weapon. Uh, so understanding that, but also planning for it. Uh, I, I think of the work GAO just did with the um, AI accountability framework, which works to set up some of those um, guardrails and questions to ask to make sure technology is used in a, uh, uh, a fair and responsible way. Things like that are, are really important um, markers along the road to make sure uh, innovation uh, can remain on a, a forward path and, and not get derailed um, by, um, uh, of course, legitimate concerns, but uh, there are ways to address those concerns and mitigate the risks to enable technology development moving forward. And that, that's, that's where this whole ecosystem comes together and, and uh, everyone has to be working uh, in partnership. Thanks. I wanted to pull the thread a little bit um, specifically with Dr. Wilbon. Um, you know, you mentioned the private sector and, and their key role in, in innovation. Um, and I think our GAO audience would be really interested to hear uh, what your thoughts are on, on trends in the private sector that you see defining the next century. You know, you, you talk a lot about entrepreneurship. So um, how, how you feel like that fits in and how folks, at, what folks at GAO might need to know as we plan forward the next century. Sure. So uh, there, in terms of trends, I, one of the things or a couple of things that I think are, are important to realize, and I think it was touched on by a few people already, and that is the, the concept of, of collaboration and creating an ecosystem between uh, small businesses, big businesses, governments, and, and also other nations uh, to ensure we have a competitive landscape. But um, one, one trend in, in terms of technology, I think that, that we all have to recognize, and, and some people know this already, is um, you, you've heard the term, the product life cycle and the compression of the, comp the product life cycle. We go through this introduction growth phase uh, maturity and decline, all of that's been shortened and, and compressed. So for example, you know, it, it, uh, to have a product in a development, research and development cycle and get it to the introduction phase to get to the market has been shortened because you really don't have time to, to spend a lot of time on R&D before a competitor will come and sweep, sweep you off your feet. Um, and so we have a very small time frame to get a product from an R&D phase to a, to a uh, commercial phase. Um, and then that growth, growth phase is even shortened. So it's much more aggressive. 
maturity phase has been adjusted because it's been compressed and, and we have companies who don't have the capacity to sustain a, a long maturity phase like we used to where we had GM, for example, who, who was able to sustain the combustible engine for many, many years, even though there was a lot of uh, push for electro, electric cars until recently, um, they, were not be able to, they were not able to keep those on the sideline. And then also uh, products are going into decline much faster. So uh, uh, we have to be much more uh, progressive in our thinking about how to manage products and the whole life cycle of technology because it's changing so fast. And we, I think we see even in recent examples with the COVID pandemic, how that's actually happened, right? Um, traditionally, we had these scientific methods where you had to go through this linear process of clinical trials and, um, and so forth and clinical research. And that's shifted dramatically because we needed to. We needed to in order to, to, to for basically survival. Um, so we couldn't have this, this uh, linear approach whereby you would do the research, go through these phase trials, and then you, uh, uh, the, the company would get approval, and then you create a product and manufacturing and so forth. We had to collapse all of that, right? And so uh, at the same time that the phases were going on, Pfizer was actually producing uh, vaccines, and Moderna was producing vaccines, and we were wait, waiting for the, the approval process to take place. Uh, uh, through FDA. And all, while all that's happening, we're also building up the markets, right, in order to distrib distribute the products. Um, and so we, we have this, this compression taking place, and everybody's involved, big business, government, small businesses are, are part of the innovation process because they, they're creating rapid tests, and so forth. Local governments are involved because we have to execute and distribute these vaccines. Um, and at the same time, once the FDA approval takes place, then you can start the process and launch and continue in a much faster pace. If we don't have that compression or, or manage that product compression, we're gonna find ourselves in a very um, uh, difficult situation, right? Where we're not gonna be able to respond on the next crisis as quicker. And this compression is gonna happen more and more. Um, so those trends are very important for us to manage. And I, I talked about the term structural inertia. The more structures we put in place that inhibit that, that uh, ability to manage these types of crises, is gonna be detrimental to our, our um, long-term survival of some of these organizations, the efficiency of, of government and, and other entities. Um, and these challenges are real, right? They're happening not in just technology uh, that we know of, we have this health uh, challenge, but somebody mentioned environmental issues, you know, same types of issues, right? Uh, fires, hurricanes, floodings, droughts, um, economic dependencies, uh, human and demographic changes, all these things are gonna have a, uh, a, a huge effect on how we live. And you have to figure out a way to be much more agile in responding to some of these issues. And so um, I think those are the things that we, we really have to kind of pay attention to as we move forward with and, and particular trends that we can wrap our arms around uh, when it comes to uh, building, building this ecosystem and looking forward to the next hundred years. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and this segues nicely into a question that someone from the audience had about the pandemic. Um, so Dr. Wilborn, you mentioned that that this compressed life cycle of getting products out, we saw in the pandemic with vaccines and test kits and that sort of thing. Um, the, audi uh, the question from the audience asked, you know, what are the lessons learned that we've learned from the pandemic and how can we apply those going forward in the future? Um, so I will, that's a free for all for anyone who wants to take it. Well, Jen, I'll kick us off because we've done a lot of work on this at GAO and the, uh, there's, there's a pandemic preparedness perspective, like think of it like as, as in the way FEMA would do sort of in that Homeland Security type domain, but there's also the public health uh, answer as well, which is really, I think uh, the macro lesson that we have on this is we really do need to get serious about surveillance systems where we're in a world where Google's a verb and we have all this, you know, like we were talking about this digital data, all these sort of things, but we're not leveraging it algorithmically. You're seeing it in that way. We have, we have a world leading epidemiological system, right? That, that works on data, but we're still thinking in, in terms of uh, an older uh, term frame of reference. Uh, that is what we have found. So whether it's the data and the modeling, remember the the White House daily briefings on modeling and things and the models we, we know we're going to be wrong. The question was just by how much, nonetheless decisions have to be made. So we have to improve our data, our surveillance that leads to the improvement of data, which then leads to the improvement of 
uh, the public health uh, decision support system, which is really what that was. And you have to have the workforce along the way that thinks algorithmically in order to, uh, to, to support such a system. So it's in one sense, not a technical challenge. It just has to be there. One of the things as we talked about mRNA is that we just need to continue to think about how we develop a national stockpile of these kind of, uh, these, these kind of things and work with agility uh, you know, when Anthony was talking about how we, we responded to the vaccine, it was, and, and the Operation Warp Speed, it was an unprecedented rate where all the clinical trials were essentially stacked on one another, and we reduced into a matter of nine months, what normally would take a decade. Uh, in terms of getting that. And so we've proven that with an, an, an extremist environment, we can move when we need to. And so the question is, well, why are we taking a decade for any other thing without a pandemic? Why is that, I think that's gonna be totally unacceptable. So we're gonna have to say, well, we have messenger RNA. What do we do with flu? What do we do with Alzheimer's? What do we do with cancer? What do we do with you know, this or that kind of thing? Not just mRNA is a solved solution to everything, but you get my point is in a more agile way uh, cross-sectoral, interdisciplinarity uh, to it, and again, all driven by digital services-oriented thinking, uh, all of that under, underneath the hood in terms of doing that. Great, thanks, Tim, for that answer. Um, I know we also have a, a couple of folks that we learned about in the introduction are really thinking about climate change, um, Dr. Mooney and Mr. Gaffigan. Um, and I, I think this could this is really one of those those challenges that is very complex, touches a lot of things, um, you know, has many implications beyond just the changing climate, which I think someone had talked about earlier. So I wanted to hand it over to you if, if you guys um, what you all see is the impact of the changing climate and how it's really gonna affect us going forward. Um, I, could, I could jump in to start uh, if you like. Um, well, I think clearly there are many impacts and uh, probably not even enough time to even make a list of them in the amount of time that we have available. But, um, you know, I, I do think that, uh, that climate change is certainly uh, perhaps a, if not the one of the enormous questions as, as we go forward uh, to the to the future, but um, you know some of the Im impacts that I see in sort of trying to think back on um, uh, this idea of collaboration across sectors. Uh, I think Mark mentioned earlier on, you know, in evaluating programs, you know, what are the criteria, what is your role, and, um, you know, thinking about our many uh, mission-driven agencies that, that really do um, excellent uh, jobs, you know, the way in, I think, the way in which some of the agencies might approach their mission might be um, uh, slightly different in the, in the future. You know, we've kind of, kind of talked about, uh, you know, the resources that need to come to bear to help them approach their mission might be different as they move forward. You know, we've talked about the interdisciplinary nature of um, many of the, the issues, you know, that might sort of um, that might suggest, you know, an expanded uh, uh, type of workforce to kind of help uh, address some of these problems. <clears throat> And then also, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, that, of course, the climate change and uh, its effect on resources, health, economy, really everything that we can think of, you know, um, I think leads to this uh, question of communication and how do we communicate effectively across all of these different sectors that are affected. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, of course, one of the things I'm really interested in is, you know, how you can develop um, a workforce that is able to be both agile and communicative and be able to, uh, to at least hear the perspectives and uh, bring them to bear um, uh, on thinking about really complicated um, problems. So um, I, I, did, I did notice that, you know, that someone had mentioned sort of the role of non-experts as well, you know, in some of these um, issues. You know, I think that, of course, you know, the number of experts that we have is, is sort of very small, I think, in, in relation to the population, you know, that we're, um, uh, a number of people are putting out this expert knowledge and then other people are kind of, you know, needing to sort of, in a way, trust 
against uh, that. And I think that the more people that you can uh, bring into the conversation so that you hear their viewpoints, because certainly people are affected very diff differently um, by uh, some of the events that, that we've had recently and that we'll see coming forward. I think that that, again, that communication bringing people in is going to lead to, I hope, um, increased trust and also perhaps more minds brought to bear on how do we solve these problems. Thank you. Yeah, excellent, um, Dr. Mooney. And, you know, we employ a lot of um, your students after they graduate, so keep sending them to us. Uh, we have plenty of work to do. Um, you know, I our work on climate change has evolved, um, you know, over the last 20 years. Um, you know, initially uh, there was a lot of sort of, well, is this a thing? You know, it goes back to uh, 1990 when they established the U.S. Uh, global climate change research program uh, under the Bush administration. And, you know, we early days spent a lot of time, you know, helping Congress understand what was happening. Was this true? What can you do to mitigate? And, you know, a lot of work looking at how we um, address the causes. And I'm sorry, this, the answer back then is still the same answer today. Um, it's driven by um, a lot of human activity and primarily the burning of fossil fuels. And uh, that is um, that has been the case ever since, but there hasn't been much of an appetite to address that issue directly, and more of the work now is, is switched to adaptation. Um, and and we have done work in, in both areas, but most recently focused on issues around adaptation. How do we build resilience to the things that are happening? And I think that um, I I'm hopeful that it'll kind of come full circle. And what is happening is. I like to use the analogy of the dangerous intersection without the stoplight and uh, you know nothing happens for a while and then somebody says you know that looks a little dangerous kind of a blind spot there or maybe we should put the stoplight or stop sign there and nothing happens and then all of a sudden there's an accident and someone's hurt and then unfortunately someone's killed and what we're seeing now is the impacts of climate throughout the world and in our own communities are impacting people um, whether it's extreme heat uh, the wildfires we're seeing, the severe storms, and unfortunately, it's almost like we have to be hit with it before we realize we want to do something about it. And, um, you know, I am hopeful that, you know, we'll continue to do the kind of work that we're doing to talk about how the federal government can help respond in this area. And again, as we've talked about, collaboration is key, but the federal government can be an integrator, it can provide incentives, it can provide information but also perhaps want to consider the fact that, you know, an ounce of prevention, you know, might be worth a pound of cure. And if we recognize that fact and bringing it back to technology, um, when Professor Wilbon was talking about the, uh, the connection between, you know, electric cars and internal combustion engine, you know, electric cars right from the beginning back to, you know, Henry Ford day, they were in the running. And a the reason they didn't win the day is the internal combustion engine with uh, fossil fuels was the most efficient, cheapest, provided the most power, most reliable, and that's the way we went. And price matters. So we have to start thinking about those externalities that come from the burning of fossil fuels and whether we wanna put a price on those externalities. Otherwise, we're gonna be spending a lot more money, all right, on the cure versus the prevention. And again, it's gonna take, you know, a commitment, um, not only in the US, but around the world to, to commit to those things. So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, going forward, we'll see, uh, continue to see the work in adaptation, but perhaps folks will be more interested in what are some uh, aspects of uh, mitigation that we can do to address some of these problems. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I think we've got a good, well, maybe not a good handle, but I think we've heard about many challenges that we'll have to face in the future. So. Um, I, my next question is more about the planning side of things. Um, so what are things to think about when creating a strategic plan? Um, how can we start preparing for, for change? We might not know exactly what it is, but we know that change will come. Um, and for this question, I'd like to start with Mr. Sanford since he's had so much um, experience in strategic planning. Yeah, thank you, Jen. So strategic planning is really important to GAO. We are in the midst right now of uh, updating and uh, developing a new strategic plan for GAO uh, for another four or five year period. Uh, we'll be issuing that uh, plan early next year. And it's an important uh, moment for the agency as, as with any organization that does strategic planning to, to take a strategic pause and think about 
what are the things it's going to be focused on uh, in the future, uh, and what will it need? Uh, planning is uh, as much a uh, you know, resource uh, allocation and, and planning exercise as anything. And as has already been mentioned today, a lot of emphasis on uh, workforce, on technology. You know, it's a good time to think about what are the um, what are the the people, the skills, the experiences we're going to need to meet those challenges in the future. Uh, what are the types of technologies we might encounter, and what are the types of technologies we're going to need? Uh, so, you know, one example of that is uh, we've already uh, started thinking about uh, data literacy, for example, for GAO's workforce. Uh, I'm partnered up with our chief learning officer at GAO and also with uh, the head of uh, the innovation lab in, in uh, STAA, uh, uh, Kirsten Austin and, and Taka Riga. And, and we're partnering across the agency and thinking about what are those skills um, that our people need as auditors, as uh, folks uh, providing assurance and accountability. And a big part of that's going to be data, data literacy. And, and um, so anticipating future needs is an important part of uh, strategic planning, having a diverse range of viewpoints and um, experiences represented at the table from both within and also outside uh, the organization uh, is important. And, um, you know, as well, making sure that we are focused on the issues of greatest national importance. And that's really what our strategic plan at GAO is. Uh, it's a blueprint for us, a roadmap for us to uh, execute our mission in, in serving Congress. And uh, given the breadth of uh, the federal government's scope, uh, it, it is a uh, uh, enormously broad remit in terms of, of planning, uh, but one which the whole agency comes together to do and is really essential to lay the groundwork for how we're going to organize and operate uh, to meet those challenges. One of the things, Jen, that, uh, that Steve mentioned uh, on this question in terms of, you know, is, is our innovation lab and then uh, Taka is our chief data scientist. He's Gia's first chief data scientist and we have, we have the lab doing digital, but this is just an exciting partnership. Steve already mentioned um, the work that we are doing on our AI accountability framework and that's been very successful and is gonna be an ongoing tool in terms of Gia's oversight, but on the strat planning side, when we founded the Innovation Lab, the Comptroller General uh, told me that his top three priorities were, I need the lab to work on some of the big challenges. Number one was improper payments. Uh, number two was uh, working with our, our fraud team. Uh, and then number three was doing what we think of, it, or I would call a strategic gap analysis. And so this is sort of in when my remarks about going digital on things, we're doing that in the lab because Talk has been working with Steve to develop a way to scan or do sense making of what's coming out of the news and then we'll look backward and crosswalk and say, what's in our plan or what's in our published uh, you know, set of documents and things so that we understand what are we missing? Because it's those errors of omission that we need to see and, and have that sort of uh, try. We can't predict the black swan event, but we can try and at least try and mitigate. Mark said it exactly right. It's a ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I really do see it as GEO's role in strat planning as a key part of that and having sort of, again, looking under the hood and having this digital algorithmic approach to help, you know, not replace the human. There's still, you know, we still need to determine what are these things? Is that a thing? What's the priority? What's the risk? But that's the, some of the stuff that I think is, is the future of, of how we think about strat planning. We have to move GAO from just looking only retrospectively and saying, oh yes, you know, something terrible happened and Congress says, thanks very much, but what can we do about it, right? We do need to always have that look forward at least a little bit, even in our audit work to say, here's some lessons learned to try to do that. Or like Mark has been doing in his climate change portfolio out of NRE to say, Look, we're trying to do this now because you really—it's a long time time horizon, but you have to start now, and that's really, I think, the, the key challenge we face. Yeah, thanks for that. I wanted to pull in Dr. Mooney a little bit here because I know, um, Dr. Mooney, you have some interest in science-based decision making, and I, I think that might be relevant when we're thinking of strategic planning and how we make decisions and that sort of thing. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, Jen. 
Um, well, in, in, indeed, uh, I, I couldn't help but uh, agree that we need science-based uh, decision-making, you know, because I, I do think that the facts are very important uh, and to get born to gather the data so that we understand really what's going on. And then um, also then to have the personnel that are able to interpret and make um, either forecasts or conclusions or kind of understand, you know, either look backwards and say, well, now we understand what happened. And then also to perhaps be able to use those data to say well and we think that this you know paired with some other things we think that this might happen in the future and uh, and I can only say I mean I, I you know the US does have a tremendous uh, science infrastructure uh, and that it has been brought to bear on so many different issues here but I can only stress that uh, certainly from my perspective I just think that that's vitally important going forward because I you know without good data you can't make good decisions and and clearly you know we cannot forecast the future we do not have a crystal ball there are always uh, unexpected things that come up that you didn't really think about because the world does have a lot of random um, events that that you can't foresee that uh, that are come up at you but I think you know being able to plan for a variety of possible futures and probable futures uh, being able to look forward and think well we think that these five things for example might be likely let's let's pursue all of these I also think you know if you gather um good science-based information on a number of possible futures if it's not quite what you expect you also might have enough information that you can pivot and uh, and instead you know pursue the thing that actually did happen and so i do uh, you know think a real strong um uh, training system, um, monitoring system, you know, sensors, whatever it is that's that's required. And then also, of course, the social science aspect of it, too. I mean, really kind of understanding what's going on in the population, just not necessarily what's happening in the physical environment is also massively important to pair with that. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, so we talked a little bit about challenges and we just finished talking about planning and decision making around those challenges. I'd like to give each one of our panelists um, a couple minutes to talk about uh, the natural fall on, which is what are these the opportunities? What are the big opportunities you see in your field um, coming in the next century? Uh, we can predict a little bit if you want, if we're all here a hundred years from now, I think we're doing great. So we won't have to you know, worry about if we got it right or wrong. Um, so uh, let me, let's see, if Dr. Wilbon, if you could kick us off, that would be great. Sure. Um, so I, I guess if we're talking particularly about education, uh, and we've talked a lot about technology and small business from my perspective, but from education, uh, I, I think the biggest opportunities for us, and it kind of relates to some of the things that Tim and Steve and other people have mentioned, um, is uh, a focus on technology literacy and technology skill enhancement. Uh, we become very dependent as a as a society on uh, data, uh, so big data analysis, uh, artificial intelligence, all of those things have to be embedded into the into the work into the uh, academic institutions to make sure that regardless of your discipline, that you have a basic technology literacy, um, and so we have to make sure we infuse that going forward into the the next century, and that has to be just kind of a basic uh, uh, process that we go through, just like taking math and English and anything else. Um, and and uh, secondly, I think that we have to create a better environments for experiential learning so that our students, there's going to be, I think, a merger or a, 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 a collaboration that's going to be much more closely knit than we've had in the past between academics and uh, business or academics and government or academics and any corporate entity, whereby uh, there is going to be a, an opportunity for us to uh, train our students, not only with the basics of an academic education, but also with the experiences that they need so they can transition relatively quickly into the workforce. All right, so we're not talking about um, uh, pure workforce development training that you would see at, at uh, vocational schools, but there's gonna be some derivative of that where we, we blend the traditional academic higher education experience with an experiential component where students can get experiences in the classroom. Uh, and then uh, I think thirdly, we talked about uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and innovation. Uh, we have to in, uh, kind of create opportunities for our students to explore entrepreneurship as an option. We cannot just continue to train people to go into the workforce without giving them some kind of exposure to thinking through uh, entrepreneurship and innovation as an option. 
we're going to need those minds to, to help us find a solution to these complex problems that we're talking about. Um, and we need to think about them differently than they do uh, through the traditional academic process. Um, and then lastly, I'll, I'll add this because I think this has come up a couple of times. There are a lot of different social dynamics that we need to infuse in the curriculum that we, that we haven't in the past. Some are doing it better than others. Uh, social impacts. What are some of the social impacts of the world that we need to uh, ensure that our students have a basic understanding about? Uh, how, how are we addressing things like so, uh, sustainable innovation, sustainability and innovation? Uh, leadership training. Uh, we, we, we've had various views about the, the dearth of leadership in corporate structures and government and so forth. How do we make sure we get that kind of training into our students to make sure that we prepare them going forward? So there's kind of a social entrepreneurship piece attached to this as well. So I think, again, there's, there's going to be a lot of changes in, in the academic space that need to be adapted, uh, and it's going to be emerging over time. Right? We, we talk about strategic planning. The strategy uh, that, that, I, that I like to, to um, use as I think Tim threw the, the word agile out at the beginning is an agile strategic plan uh, as, a, as opposed to a more prescriptive that it emerges over time. And so as these things shift and changes, we're, we're gonna have to make some adjustments in the academic space as well. Thank you, Dr. Booney, I'll go to you next. Uh, what, what are some opportunities that you're looking forward to in the next century? Well, thank you. Well, first of all, um, I, I would agree with everything that, uh, that Anthony has just mentioned. I think that these, he's already really outlined uh, several opportunities. And so I, I won't repeat some of that, but a couple of things that I was uh, thinking about is, you know, he mentioned, you know, uh, innovation, data analysis, technical literacy. I would also um, add to that, um, you know, this, uh, this ability for collaboration and communication, again, because of the complex natures of many problems, you know, that we need to um, train people who are clear uh, communicators, able to collaborate. And, um, and then again, I think this, this, this word agile, we might want to think about adaptability, because I, I think that the pace of change, again, is moving so quickly that uh, as educational institutions, and of course, uh, educational institutions are already thinking about, about this, but I think that we need to sort of crack this nut is like the, um, you know, the constant retraining of people as well, you know, because right now, of course, our model is generally, you know, you'd come in for several years and you get your degree or which, you know, your master's, or your PhD, your bachelor's, and, um, and then you might never come back uh, again. And I, I do think, you know, the, a lot of things are, tra are changing very, very quickly. And I think, you know, trying to look at just our whole model, actually, of how we can best serve um, the country and the workforce, you know, in terms of um, creating people that have the skills that we need right now, both in science and in business, um, that kind of thing. You know, I think it's incumbent upon us to try and think of these new models, because I do think that people uh, need retraining with new skills as time goes on. Um, you know, like AI, for example, is relatively um, new in the big scheme of things, and people that got their degrees 20 years ago might know nothing about this, but yet it's like really important and has an enormous impact on society. Um, I would also really uh, uh, stress that I think that there is, you know, I think we're already doing this, but I can only stress it again, that I think that, you know, we need to develop people with really strong uh, technical uh, skills, but also great soft skills. And, and again, um, this points to that we don't work in silos anymore, that nature of work has really changed, and this is really necessary for um, uh, collaboration. And then, um, I think that, you know, we talked about also the idea of innovation labs, and I think it actually came up in the context of the GAO's own innovation lab. But, uh, you know, I think that that's another area where universities are, I mean, we're already doing some of this, but I think some, we could do some more of this, you know, where we get uh, people together to work on a thorny, a thorny problem, such as you would do uh, when you when you leave. So you already um, adept at uh, thinking about, well, you know, there's a number of different perspectives that you might bring to bear to solve this problem, or this problem actually might never be solved um, within the two months that you have to, to address it, but what can you do to kind of make progress on? And, and I think that that's really an excellent uh, opportunity for um, collaboration. 
I'll, I'll just finish with with one comment too, and I also want to echo um, Anthony's comment here. You know, I think the infusion into many of our technic technical sorry, technological problems with the idea of justice and equity as well. I think, you know, looking at some of our problems through these uh, on challenges through these different lenses, I also think that we need to do more of that as we're going forward in the future. And I, I do feel that the educational system is um, paying attention to this, but I still think that we have uh, quite far to go to, to, really, to really incorporate that effectively. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Sanford, I'll go to you next. Sure. Th thanks, Jen. Uh, it's been great being here today with everybody. Uh, you know, I'll start by saying 100 years is a really long time. Uh, we are living in an era where a lot could change in just 100 days. And if we rewind back to 1921, when the Budget and Accounting Act was signed that created GAO and kind of launched our first 100 years, the vision of what GAO was back then and the types of People who worked at GAO, uh, you know, accountants, very, very different from where we are today as an institution. So it shows over the arc of time, a uh, hundred years, a lot of transformation can take place. Uh, we have a very different type of workforce right now at GAO in terms of being a multidisciplinary uh, uh, group steeped in the social sciences and the engineering sciences in um, law. Um, actuarial sciences, things like that. So we bring to the table as an institution a lot more uh, than we did 100 years ago. And I think that evolution will continue. Um, you know, the other unique thing about GAO is, is the place we, we sit in government uh, being a uh, you know, trusted uh, resource for the Congress to provide uh, independent nonpartisan analysis. And with the scope uh, that I mentioned earlier, where we, we are looking across the whole of government, that's a very unique set of, of qualities, our, our people, uh, our values, and, and also where we sit in the scope of our work. Uh, so oftentimes in, in foresight, you, you think about how to change the future and, and what variables could change in the future. But sometimes you also hold certain things constant and create certain um, uh, constraints around those futures. I think those three elements I talked about, you know, our perch in government and the scope we have, um, our people and our values uh, are going to be constant over the next 100 years. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there for us to uh, adapt further as an institution um, to meet those, those future challenges, whether it's uh, real-time auditing or uh, leveraging data in different ways. But um, all the while, it's going to be, you know, leveraging uh, our, our people. And, and relying on our people to come up with creative and innovative ways to meet those challenges over the next hundred years. I think that's gonna be the, the key thing for us. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gaffigan? No, thanks, Jen. I'll try to quickly um, tie a couple of things I heard together. You know, um, Dr. Wilbon talked about technical literacy, uh, absolutely. Um, earlier, um, Professor Mooney talked about science-based uh, decision making. Uh, Steve talked about us being a trusted resource. And so I'll come from the opportunity of GAO, which is to provide the facts. And it's embedded in our core values of accountability, or integrity, and reliability. And the role we can play in the next 100 years, the opportunity we have is continue to be that honest broker. We have that reputation uh, of being a trusted resource, as Steve says. What I think the, the opportunity going forward is to get in the game because there's still a lot of people that don't know who, who's GAO. And, and I'm always uh, struck by a conversation I had with someone who came to GAO who worked on the Hill and said, you know, I didn't realize how much information you have here and how much expertise you have on a whole variety of issues. And if we are not out there um, basically marketing what we offer, um, we're gonna get lost. And if everybody's relying on the internet for their information, um, we're gonna be in a world of hurt. It's a great tool, but there's so much disinformation, confusion out there. And if you, you type in Google climate change is, and you get a different answer depending on what part of the country you're in, that's a problem. You know, Climate change is a hoax, depending on you, you'll get that or climate change is the worst thing that's ever gonna happen. So, you know, that's a problem. And, and 
you know, we had a sort of thing we talked about when I first started Geo and in terms of how you got facts and how we did our work. And it was sort of frowned upon that you would, you know, be, we call it auditing by newspaper, which meant, you know, whatever was in, you know, the, the newspapers, you would gather facts that way. That was, that was unheard of and it was frowned upon. So the internet today is auditing by newspaper. Um, that's not actually where all the facts are. You have to dig and you've got to dig and you've got to dig. And that's the opportunity to make sure you bring all perspectives so you have complete, accurate, comprehensive, well-respected information. However, if we're not getting the word out, right? If a geo report falls in a tree and no, in a forest and no one's there to hear it, right? Does it make a sound? And we got we to gotta take an opportunity to make our, our products more um, friendly, to compete, so the use of visuals to get the information out um, to our to our um, to the people that need to hear that information because that information is a great um, that's the starting point for the collaboration to begin to to address these issues. So I see that as a particular opportunity for the GAO in the next hundred years. Thank you, and Dr. Persons, you get the final word. Yeah, so I'll just say I got my choir robes on. Mark is preaching my sermon. I'm, I say yes and amen to that for sure. And that transition has started. Uh, we're proud to say we have our uh, pandemic related CARES Act work is out in HTML format that's you know fitting to that more digital uh, type media and channels that we have uh, for the warp speed program and oversight. We created a digital dashboard. Uh, uh, in terms of doing real time for the House Select Subcommittee on Coronavirus. It was wildly successful in terms of their ability to, to dive in and do that. Anyone can see it at ows.gaoinnovations.gov. But um, the other thing that's coming out is on our fraud thing, we're gonna have a fraud dashboard to help mitigate risk. I mean, all, everything Mark said is absolutely the case. I think the future for GAO in the next century is turning from a report centric mindset in terms of a product and turning into a content. Because like Mark said, we, we are sitting on a Fort Knox of governmental knowledge and wisdom, and we're not leveraging it in the way it's not, and I'm not blaming anybody on the trying to just say there's so much opportunity, right, Jen, to your question that to get that out there and get it in the timely, uh, trusted, nonpartisan manner that Mark talked about, talked about. So I think that's a big opportunity. For the United States, I'll just close. I say, I think you know our best days are still ahead. We are still the most innovative country uh, in the world. I think we're going to see uh, the CRISPR, the the genetic uh, hacking uh, type uh, capability, is going to help solve some of the big uh, dis gnarly diseases that we're dealing with. Again, health is the key word. Uh, I think we're going to you know have an incredible. We're still. Uh, we've made incredible advances in agricultural science. I think there's still a lot to go. Sean mentioned water. That's another big area. How we manage about water could be the new oil in terms of how those things go on. And to Mark's point, we will adapt. We have to think in a resilient framework uh, to do that. We've adapted before to climate change, and yet I think it's going to be America that will create the value proposition for the great decarbonization that needs to happen. So I think that's the big thing that could go on. And I think we can do it with digital and uh, services, data enabled type things to help drive better solutions toward equity, justice, accountability, et cetera, across all the boards, whether it's education, whether it's in uh, the environment, whether it's in the food supply or whatever, all of that is coming. It's gonna be very exciting. So I look forward to seeing what my kids and then their kids after them and, uh, you know, are going to be seeing as they rise to the challenge, as indeed they will, uh, to deal with these things. So thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you once again to all of our panelists for having this fantastic webinar. Um, this turned out really well. And thank you for celebrating GAO Centennial. Um, this will be recorded and posted uh, on our, our web page. Um, so we're looking forward to that and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.